We proudly welcome artist Samantha Sherry as our sponsor on the How to Love Lit podcast. Sam is a world-class artist specializing in animal portraits. We invite you to check out her work at samanthasherry.com. Tell her Christian Gary sent you. Again, samanthasherry.com. Shriver. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. Today, we conclude our series on the foundational documents of the United States by giving homage to one of America's earliest poetic voices, the notable Phyllis Wheatley Peters, the second woman on the American continent to publish a work of literature and the first African American woman to do so. She truly is a remarkable woman, and not just for her incredible intellect, which we'll describe in just a minute, but for her ability to express a voice in spite of all odds in an era where a voice like hers just was never heard. I was reminded of this last night when we were watching this PBS reality show called Manor House. It's this interesting social experiment set in Britain where volunteers recreate the lifestyles of the stratified society of Edwardian London, an old manor house that's been restored to its former glory. Well, one of the things that struck me in watching these characters relate was how lower servants were never to be seen by the ladies or the gentlemen of the house. And if by some horrible accident, a lady walked in while a servant was cleaning, the servant was to retreat to the corner of the room and immediately turn around, standing in this frozen position, pretending that you don't exist until the lady walked out. I remember when we watched this, uh, it was so demeaning for the maid servant, even though she knew that it was pretend she's just playing a part and the lady really isn't a lady, just a, a person pretending to be, but it made both of them really, really uncomfortable. And after they interviewed the lady and she said this, well, I'm just glad I'm nearsighted. So when I walk around the house without my glasses, I don't see them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is an interesting metaphor and really great psychological point to make. I mean, she preferred to walk around nearsighted, not actually seeing what was happening because it made her feel uncomfortable, guilty, or maybe even ashamed of what was happening. Well, today we want to put on our own literary and historical glasses and shine a spotlight on a remarkable American woman, celebrate her work, and give her voice the respect that it deserves. Well, exactly. And really just to take her out of that hidden corner of the room and make the argument that this woman established herself as one of the earliest icons in the American canon, perhaps, well, definitely ahead of her time and in spite of some incredible odds. I was wondering how you're going to come back to that metaphor and use it. I just think it was so (laughs) interesting how, you know, the stratified society, we, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. We don't, we don't think of it as much today, but the olden days and, and how that really physically looked, and, and not just in America. Well, beginning with Phyllis Wheatley, uh, she was born, we think, around 1753 in Gambia, Africa, and captured by slave traders and brought to America in 1761. She said almost nothing herself about this period of her life. Uh, after arriving, she was sold immediately to the Wheatley family in Boston. And, of course, that's already such a sad start. She's seven, maybe eight years old. What can you tell us about how something like that even happens? There is no doubt that it's a dark story. Gambia, at this time, is not an official colony of England, although it will become one during Wheatley's life. The British had actually already abolished the slave trade in 1807 all over the empire, but obviously it was still going on. Uh, It's traditionally accepted that over 3 million Gambians were stolen. They were stolen mostly by neighboring tribes. They were sold to African traders on the continent who sold many to each other for slavery was practiced all over the African continent, but the majority were sold to be sent to the Americas. And the most lucrative and simplest way to monetize a person you stole from a different tribe was to sell them to the Europeans. 
for work in the Americans, both North and South. This accounts for by far the largest number of slaves. I mean, they were captured and taken across on what is called the Middle Passage. Well, and the best description of how this felt was written by a different African American, well, he's not African American writer, a different African writer. Uh, I think both groups of people claim him, the Americans as well as the British, Alaro Equiano. He's a Nigerian who published his story in 1789 in England. In fact, he was really the one that was instrumental in bringing into public awareness the horrible reality that was this Middle Passage. His book was extremely popular, but today it's difficult to read given the datedness of the passage. I had my kids read it one year and it wasn't enjoyable. <laughs> Enjoyable. Anyway, the reason why... English is pretty heavily stylized. Yeah, it is. It's very stylized. But the reason why I bring it up, because I think it's worth... I would like to read an excerpt from his book, because I imagine what happened to him was very common, was what happened to every child that was stolen. And of course, lots of them were. And this is what... Including Phyllis. Including Phyllis, which is why I want to read it. He says this. This is a loud Equiano speaking. My father, besides many slaves, had a numerous family of which seven lived to grow up, including myself and a sister who was the only daughter. As I was the youngest of the sons, I became, of course, the greatest favorite of my mother and was always with her, and she used to take particular pains to form my mind. I was trained up for my earliest years in the arts of agriculture and war, and my mother adorned me with emblems after the manner of our greatest warriors. In this way, I grew till I turned to the age of 11, when an end was put to my happiness in the following manner. Generally, when the grown people in the neighborhood were gone far in the fields to labor, the children assembled together in some of the neighboring premises to play, and commonly some of us used to get up in a tree to look out for any assailant or kidnapper that might come upon us for they sometimes took those opportunities of our parents absence to attack and carry off as many of us as they could seize one day as i was watching at the top of a tree in our yard i saw one of those people come into the yard of our next neighbor but one to kidnap there being many stout young people in it immediately on this i gave the alarm of the rogue and he was surrounded by the sternest of them who entangled him with cords so that he could not escape till some of the grown people came and secured him But alas, long it was my fate to be thus attacked and to be carried off when none of the grown-up people were nigh. One day, when all of our people were gone out to their works as usual and only I and my sister were left to mind the house, two men and a woman got over our walls and in a moment seized us both and without giving us time to cry out or make resistance, they stopped our mouths and ran off with us into the nearest wood. Here they tied our hands and continued to carry us for as far as they could till they came on when we reached a small house when the robbers halted for refreshment and spent the night. We were then unbound but were unable to take any food and being quite overcome by fatigue and grief, our only relief was to sleep, which allayed our misfortune for a short time. Then he goes on to say that they threw him in a sack and took him away until he eventually landed on one of those boats and crossed the Middle Passage. And of course... The awfulness of being stolen, disconnected, I can't even imagine. Phyllis is at least three years younger than that, maybe four. Her arrival is only described in the first biography ever done of Wheatley, which wasn't until 1984. It reads, she arrived a poor naked child who had no other covering than a quantity of dirty carpet about her like a filibeg. And let me say that the Wheatleys got her for a bargain. They only paid 10 sterling for her. The going rate for a prime male slave was 35 sterling. But Phyllis was frail, and she had a fever and looked like she might not make it. And her mistress, Susanna Wheatley, who had lost a child of her own uh, at the age of eight, a daughter, picked her from all the other females to work as a domestic. The name of the ship was the Phyllis. Hence, Susanna chose to name her new acquisition Phyllis. Wheatley. Well, history has, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag between praise and condemnation for the family's treatment of uh, Phyllis. And of course, there's been a lot of scrutiny over the years as we've changed our position over how we should look at these kinds of things. They did educate her, they valued her, they elevated her and opened the doors to her for that weren't really open to anybody else. I'll just give you an example. Um, Phyllis was given as many candles as she could need in a room of her own to stay up and she could work on her writing as late as she wanted. That's really unusual for any girl. Uh, This is a time in the era in America where only 50% of the white female population could even write their own names. 
So that's to their credit. But then again, people have said that, well, she benefited them. She served them and she was, to their credit, made them a little bit famous. So I don't know, make of that what you will. Susanna was at least very kind and generous towards her. To their credit, in some sense, they did recognize that Phyllis was extremely unusual, especially curious and obviously precocious to use the phrase that Mary, Susanna's daughter, who was around 10 years older than her, used to describe her. Of course, on the other hand, Susanna had purchased her because she wanted to purchase for herself a companion now that her own children were getting older and moving out of the world. So maybe out of nobility, maybe out of a desire to have an educated companion. We can't determine motives this long after the fact, but we do know that she did task Mary with educating this little girl who didn't speak a word word of English. Now, you have to remember that in Boston at this time, the population was around 15,000 people. A thousand of them were black. Only 18 were free and zero went to school. But at the same time, it wasn't yet illegal to educate black slaves. In the North, most slaves were house slaves. And if you openly started or mistreated them, you're looked on as a bad person, even among slaveholders. And that narrative was supported by Frederick Douglass later on in his experience. And so to take this young girl, I want to drop her in a little historical timeline context. We'll fast forward. She grows up. She becomes a writer. Well, grows up. She's still a young lady. Anyway, uh, she drops in the United States as a little girl in the early 1760s. And within the next 10 years, this is going to transpire in the U.S., or these kind of events will. Uh, By March of 1775, we're going to have Patrick Henry's fiery Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech. In April of 75, you have the Battle of Lexington and Concord. In May of 75, Washington is made commander of the Continental Army. And from May to December, there are a number of battles that occur. And in October of 1775, Wheatley is going to write her poem for George Washington. Well, that's a little bit ahead of ourselves, but that is the poem we're going to feature in this episode. But going back to when she first gets there, it's amazing that you know, she doesn't speak any English. They think maybe she spoke Fulani, which was maybe the tribe she was from. But within 16 months, she could read the Bible, speak in English, as well as Latin and Greek classics. She studied geography and she studied astronomy. I mean, she was rivaling, they say, uh, the education of men who were educated at Harvard by the time, you know, she ends her life. So, Uh, We don't know a lot about, you know, how she was able to manage that kind of education except by Mary. But we do know that by age 11, uh, she was writing letters. And there is one from that period that we know about. She wrote a letter to a family friend, a Native American missionary named Sansom Oakham, trying to raise money uh, for Native Americans in New England, which I find particularly interesting that this little girl, age 11, the only little African-American that she knew, because she wasn't allowed to associate with other slaves, that she's already thinking about advocating for other people. But anyway, that's just an aside. She had this relationship with Oakham, and they struck up this friendship that they kept going um, all the way through 17, at least 70, 74, because we have another letter that she wrote him that's actually pretty famous. I want you, well, I'll read it, but Gary, when I read this, I want you to tell me what you think of this letter. Reverend and honored sir, I have this day received your obliging kind epistle and am greatly satisfied with your reasons respecting the Negroes and think highly reasonable that you offer in the vindication of their natural rights. Those that invade them cannot be insensible that the divine light is chasing away the thick darkness which broods over the land of Africa and the chaos which has reigned so long is converting into beautiful order and reveals more and more clearly the glorious dispensation of civil and religious liberty which are so inseparably limited and there is little or no enjoyment of one without the other. Otherwise, perhaps the Israelites had been less solicitous for their freedom from the Egyptian slavery. But I do not say they would have been contented without it. By no means. For in every human breast, God has implanted a principle which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of impression and pants for deliverance. And by the leave of our modern Egyptians, I will assert that the same principle lives in us. 
God grant deliverance in his own way and time and get him honor upon all those whose avarice impels them the countenance and help forward tile calamities of their fellow creatures. So how old was she when she wrote this? I know. <laughs> uh, A teenager. First of all, the, the language is incredibly complex and she clearly has read the Bible and many of the same texts as Jefferson and Madison and the revolutionaries, but uh, because of her circumstances, she as a young African woman can understand these concepts in ways the others cannot. This little girl has a clear central vision of God's call to freedom uh, when she has, says, for in every human breast, God has implanted a principle which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. What a great line. I can't believe a child wrote this. I agree completely. And just so you know, it was, she wrote that in 1774. So what is she? Uh, she was born in, what, 63? So Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's another reason why uh, I gave us that little quick timeline later on. I wanted to drop her poem for uh, Washington right in the middle of the deep part of the revolution. Well, what she is trying to do is convince this man who's basically going to found Dartmouth College that the revolutionaries are advocating for their own freedom, but they're not thinking about the slavery in America. And so they're living in an untenable contradiction. The Wheatleys were so well connected. I know Phyllis had to have lots of these conversations about lots of things of this nature with very important people. We know this because there's documentation that she was having conversations about Descartes and Rousseau and all these philosophers, but, you know, it's very delicate if you're a female slave. They say that people would be invited over to dinner parties and Phyllis would be sitting there in the same room expected to have conversations with them, which is unusual. Like I said, servants are supposed to be invisible in the corner, not noticed, but not her. Now she wouldn't be at the main table with the family. She'd have her own little table in the corner, but she was engaging conversations with prominent men in her community and they wanted her ideas and her opinions and she was expected to debate them well i find that a little bit mary shelley like but (laughs) (laughs) yes i was thinking of that too uh you know and what a minefield that must have been and what she must have thought about this arrangement i mean where she is clearly not an equal but yet not a slave she is an other a non-sexualized entity perhaps and of course, what I find the most fascinating about what you described to me is that she was able to glean from that. And that we can see is going to be showing up in her writing. She learned to use their language, the language of religion. Uh, she learned to use the language of American rhetoric. She knew these men honed in on the value of liberty, and she makes use of this to get admission into their world. Her poetry is patriotic and it's religious. You know, that's really true, and it's intuitively clever on her part. One of her earliest poems is called America, and she says this, The power, O liberty, makes strong the weak. I I see a lot of hope in that line. I mean, she's youthful. She's idealistic. She's writing, and, you know, maybe she's hopeful that someday these men will understand that maybe that can apply to her, too. I mean, she really has every reason to think that it might. She's ambitious. She's wanting to make a political and a literary name for herself. And she's using the power that she has to kind of make this possible. One thing that I think is incredibly clever of her, and I don't know, I don't know how this worked out, but a third of her poems are elegies. So she was memorializing people who died I don't know why. Uh, I just think it's particularly smart if you're wanting to endear yourself to people. Why not write poems about people that they cared about and loved and promoting yourself? I'm not saying it's self-serving. I'm just saying it's it's not stupid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, her most famous poem was dedicated, of course, to George Whitfield, and that's eventually what's going to get her recognized and published, but I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of the story. I would like to point out George Whitfield's one of the biggest heavy hitters of the generation, so she's having access to high places. Exactly. She lives in this really weird position of being a slave and a prodigy at the same time. And she's not treated like a slave, but she's also not treated like a regular person. person. Yeah. Yeah. 
If we do look at Wheatley as a political person, it certainly makes her independent in her view of herself and not so different than other black poets of her day, which many people didn't even know about. I think the two most famous are Lucy Terry and Jupiter Hammond, who today are studied because we have a renewed interest in revisiting colonial history through a different lens. But Lucy specifically composed poetry about Africa, things that were relevant to Africans and probably more interesting, honestly. But sadly, except for one poem called A Bar's Fight, are all gone. Nobody knows anything about her outside of history circles. And Hammond is a little more famous. He's the first African-American to publish anything in the Americas. But unlike Wheatley or even Lucy Terry, he was never ever able to leverage his talents into gaining his own freedom, something that Wheatley was allowed to do. I like looking at Wheatley like that because to me, it creates a view of her, not as the sellout as sometimes people say that she is because she didn't write about being a slave or her experiences being kidnapped in Africa or things like that. But she leveraged her talent to make a place for herself. I do want to point out that one of Jupiter Hammond's surviving poems is named and addressed to Miss Phyllis Wheatley, Ethiopian poetess in Boston who came from Africa at eight years of age and soon became acquainted with Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, It's a long name. That is. That is. <laughs> well, readers may wonder what you're talking about when you talk about how her writing is controversial, when you compare the way she writes compared to how African-Americans were writing or even feeling at the time. I mean, read for us that famous controversial poem that she wrote at age 15 titled On Being Brought to Africa. She's been totally slammed for this. Yes, and it makes sense because you remember when we think of early African-American poetry, we think of like Negro spirituals and the groaning and the suffering. So this is what she wrote. "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a savior, that there's a savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye, in quotation marks, their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train. What do you think? Hmm. Uh, I mean, the first pass, it seems she's called Africa pagan uh, and that she's so grateful to have been stolen and brought here to America to be saved. What do you think of that? Well, that's exactly how it reads. And that's a lot of how a lot of people have interpreted it. And there has been fights over this little poem. But I, I don't think good poetry can only be read once. I say that every time. And this little poem is particularly layered and I find it very interesting. Uh, First, let's just look at it poetically. It's an iambic pentameter. Da-dun, 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 da-dun. Very clever. It's in good writing. It's in the style of the time, even though today we think of it as being singy-songy. She wrote in what we call heroic couplets. In other words, the first line and the second line rhyme, and then the third line and the fourth line rhyme. Da-dun, da-dun, da-dun. You know, this is the kind of rhyme that lots of people think of when we write today. That's really traditional rhyming that's what we do usually if we don't know what we're doing or we're trying to write a poem so why do i bring this up uh well i feel like that this poem is rhetorical and it's not just talking about you know my experience coming over it's making a case that black people are people too and that's awful to say Uh, But it's, you know, when she says this, "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land." Well, that's what the white people were thinking in some sense. That That's how the Wheatleys would have felt about her. The worst line of the whole thing says, "'Their color is a diabolic dye.'" And that's in quotation marks. Well, when something's in quotation marks, it means I'm not saying that. Somebody else is saying that. Well, who are these other people? Well, they'd have to be the white people. It's not what God thinks. When she references the black race for herself, she uses the word sable, our sable race. Now, the word sable takes the idea of something that's noble. It's beautiful. If you have a sable coat, if you say, oh, I have a sable coat, that's a coat that costs $100,000 or more. So it's extremely valuable. I think what she's trying to do is use white people's logic against them. When they say, if you really think you did me this great favor by bringing me over, interesting, introducing me to Jesus, well, 
then you believe I'm a person. Look at your own logic. I, I can be refined. I'm going to heaven. If that's true, then I'm worthy. So look at the logic. If I'm a black person and I'm beautiful, that's premise number one. I'm worthy for Jesus. I'm worthy to go to go to heaven. Then that's premise number two. Then conclusion, you should treat me like I'm a beautiful person and worthy to be with you in heaven. So Wheatley doesn't go so far as to connect these dots. But when she says things like, remember, you know, she is being as a political as she can and trying to lay the foundation for the reader themselves to get to the conclusion that she's laying out for them without actually saying it. I'm always a fan of uh, great subtle writers that can say uh, wonderful things, but then you walk away and when you come back and visit a second, third, fourth time, you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's more here than I right. thought. Right, and she's 15 years old. She's, she's writing this for that. white people. I mean, mm -hmm. what is she going to say? You're an awful person. You did this to me. You schmuck. That's not going to get you, you know, the next dinner date. Well, it's definitely a delicate line to walk, and, and it's a political line. And, and I'm amazed at how she was able to walk this line, both with the Americans and with the British. Remember, these two groups are not getting along uh, all uh, all that well, but Phyllis manages to get her work printed in England as well as in America, maneuvering them skillfully between these two groups. During the time when they're warring. Um. <laughs> yes, it's, it's bad. Yeah. Uh, the Earl of Dartmouth, uh, Thomas Woodbridge, definitely a man who believed in a class system, came to Boston and wanted to meet Phyllis. And this is what he said. Uh, while in Boston, I heard of a very extraordinary female slave who made verses on our mutually deceased friend. I visited her mistress and found by conversing with the African that she was no impostor. I asked if she could write on any subject. She said, yes, we had just heard of your lordship's appointment. I gave her your name, which she was well acquainted with. She immediately wrote a rough copy of the included address and letter, which I promised to convey or deliver. I was astonished and could hardly believe my eyes. I was present when she wrote and can attest that it is her own production. Which let me go back to saying, I think it's impressive that she thought to write these uh, elegies and these dedications to these important people. Look how devoted this man walked away to, to this little girl after this event. And I also want to point out, she was put on the spot without warning. That's Basic, true. Basically told, here's a topic, you know, And when I read her poems, you know, she uses a lot of rhyme. She uses these heroic couplets. To me, it reminds me of these kids. And I always have kids that can do this every year in class. You give them a topic and they can bust out one of these raps, just about anything. And that's yeah. kind of what she's doing. She had her gait. She had her method. She had the way that she could play the words in her head. And she was able to do it really very quickly and artfully and clearly impressive because she was charming the political movers of her day. This was especially true within the Methodist church who was the church to go to at the time. She charmed, she charmed them, but if it hadn't been for Susanna promoting and promoting and promoting her, she probably wouldn't have gotten her book published. It was kind of rejected at first. You had to have so many people promise ahead of time that they would buy it. And that wasn't going to happen in the Americas during, well, right on the cuffs of the war. But with this, with the poem that she wrote about George Whitfield, her fame actually jumped the pond, as we say, <laughs> went all the way to England. And uh, she finally landed a particularly powerful patron, the Countess of Huntington. And that was the woman who really helped secure the publication for her first book of poetry in London in 1773. It's also interesting to notice that the Countess insisted that they have a picture of Phyllis in the book, which is only important to us because that's really the only photo, or it's not a photo, but the only picture we have. Yeah, representation <laughs> we have of her to this day. So that's kind of nice. Anyway, I do want to point out that being a published author in 1774 you know, is a big deal for any woman. The last American writer, Anne Bradstreet, had been over 140 years. It's been a while. Before. It'd been a while. So with this opportunity, she got this, uh, well, with this book, she got this opportunity to go to London, and she got to do so many fun things. You just can be so happy for her. So she's 18 years old. 
She's meeting all kinds of royalty. She goes to Westminster Abbey, the Royal Observatory. She visits the Tower of London. She goes to parties. They uh, treat her, you know, as if she were really a celebrity and they don't treat her like a slave. I can't even imagine, you know, the difference, how glamorous that must have felt. And her book sold. It sold really well. It sold in England. It sold in Scotland. And it opened the door because she was in England and because of the law of the land in England. If she wanted to, she could have self-emancipated there. She did not have to be a slave anymore once she stepped on English soil. But uh, she's going to give it up. And maybe she shouldn't have done that. But she receives word that Susanna's health is in decline, really bad decline. And she decides, you know, to go back to the Americas, sadly. And didn't she pass up an audience with King George yes, III? Yes, she did. She she had to turn down an invitation to meet King George. And she never got to meet the Countess either. Because she had lined these up. But when she decided to go back, everything happened. And there she went and she missed out. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is no doubt things went downhill fast, and a lot of that honestly had to do with the American Revolutionary War. Um, It's not a great time to try to be a poet, but the story goes that Wheatley arrives back in the U.S. before her book even gets published, so she wasn't even one of the first ones to have a copy. She leaves in July. She arrives in the U.S. in early September. Well, we know from uh, Phyllis's poetry that when she was very well aware that in England she wasn't a slave— Uh, There's a poem that she wrote, and she calls England health, celestial dame. And when she talks, if you had read the whole poem, she talks about health meaning freedom. And when she arrives in England, she's going to arrive at health. So I would have to assume when she leaves England, she knows that the reverse is also true. But, you know, she's devoted to Susanna, and even while she's caring for Susanna in her last days, you know, she's writing letters, trying to market her book as best she can. On October 18, Phyllis is going to write, Since my return to America, my master has, at the desire of my friends in England, given me my freedom. The instrument is drawn so as to secure me and my property from the hands of the executors, administrators of my master, and secure whatsoever she can be given as my own. Well, Susanna dies on March 3rd of 1774, leaving Phyllis to fend for herself, and neither of Susanna's children care to take care of her. Her husband lets her live with him, but by October she is set free, except with nothing and at the worst possible time to be on the street. And we don't think about that, but to be an African American in the United States doesn't give you a whole lot of you know, financial opportunity, especially if you're a, a poet. <laughs> but anyway, uh, her most famous poem is really going to come at this time. She is still trying to leverage herself into some kind of success. It's written, and it's my favorite one. It's written to His Excellency General Washington. It's dated October 25, 1775. Uh, Americans are in war, but this isn't the time that they know they're going to win the war, it's still pretty early on. <laughs> it's pre-Declaration of Independence, but that last year, it saw a lot of actual real fighting. And how, so from 1775, how long is it going to be before the United States is actually done with the war? Oh, 1783. It's going to drag on for a better part of seven years. So she had no reason to believe in 1775 that the person she should be appealing to, I mean, she sh- could have thought, maybe I should write the King George, but she she doesn't. She writes about George Washington. He is, of course, one of the most prominent men at the time in the United States. Uh, I don't know, but maybe she hoped that he would publish the poem and and help give her the kind of help that she needs as a non-employed, struggling person on the street. This is what she'd done in the past. It's what happened with George Whitfield. Uh, I don't know how she thought about it. But anyway, she writes him this personal poem. She puts it in a letter and she sends it to him. And sure enough, he writes her back. He obviously had heard of her and he wrote her back. Gary, you want to read the letter that George Washington wrote to Phyllis Wheatley? Yes, the style is amazing. Uh, So this is from George Washington to Phyllis Wheatley, uh, the 20th of February, 1776. Mrs. Phyllis... 
Your favor of the 26th of October did not reach my hands till the middle of December. Time enough, you will say, to have given an answer ere this. Granted, but a variety of important occurrences continually interposing to distract the mind and withdraw the attention, I hope will apologize for the delay and plead my excuse for the seeming but not real neglect. I thank you most sincerely for your polite notice of me in the elegant lines you enclosed, and however undeserving I may be of such encomium and panegyrics, the style and manner exhibit a striking proof of your great poetical talents. In honor of which, and as a tribute justly due to you, I would have published the poem had I not been apprehensive that while I only meant to give the world this new instance of your genius, I might have incurred the imputation of vanity. This and nothing else determined me not to give it a place in the public prints. If you should ever come to Cambridge or near headquarters, I shall be happy to see a person so favored by the muses and to whom nature has been so liberal and beneficent in her dispensations. I am, with great respect, your obedient, humble servant, George Washington. So sweet. He did have a few things that might have distracted him from immediately writing. That. He might have. And, and how many people can claim they've received a letter like this from George Washington? Uh, Washington, you know. <laughs> not very many other female poets and probably not very many other American slaves at the time. Even though I know it must have been disappointed because basically it's a rejection letter saying it's wonderful, uh, but I don't want to publish it. It'll look too vain and I can't publish something about myself, which I guess makes sense. Well, and we're also gearing up for the actual war. And uh, and so Washington knows that a lot of his military stance is political also, and he doesn't want to be seen as self-aggrandizing because of that. Yeah, it, it would be kind of awkward. So I want to read this poem because I really do love this poem, but there's a few things I want you to know so you can kind of understand it because it's hard to read things that are this old. First of all, and I think this is so cool, Wheatley invented this classically styled goddess of the American Revolution called Columbia. So if you've heard of Columbia, thank you, Phyllis Wheatley. That is so cool because we use this word all the time and nobody knows what it where its origin came from. True. I mean, there's Columbia Pictures, Columbia University, the Columbia Space Shuttle. I want to point out that's Columbia with a U. The, the, the Latin American country is with an O. Yeah, true. But anyway, I think it still comes from Columbus, but it doesn't matter. She made up this word. It's so cool. And it was a, a great competitor to be the name of this country at some point. Yeah. Well, let me just, I need to refrain that. I don't know. I can't really say for sure if she invented it, but she definitely popularized it. What she does in this poem is she takes the, the word Columbia and she turns it into a woman. So in the poem, she talks about the United States as if she were a woman. She says, Columbia scenes of glorious toils I write. So you can tell that Columbia is the United States. So she's going to make the country a personification, this female personification of this beautiful form, but it's a landmass. So in other words, she's using all of her classical mythology training, and she's going to kind of create this American mythology really before we knew that we even were going to be a country. Uh, remember, it's 1775. This isn't the real America. This is her idealized mythological vision of what it could be. Now, to me, this is clever because who is she writing? She's writing General Washington with the idea being, this is what we are. This is who we are. This is what you're fighting for. You, General, can make this happen. It's, it's really amazing. Well, with that in mind, let's read it. Okay, here it goes. Celestial choir enthroned in realms of light, Columbia's scenes of glorious toils I write. While freedom's cause her anxious breast alarms, she flashes dreadful and refulgent arms. See Mother Earth, her offspring's fate bemoan, and nations gaze at scenes before unknown. See the bright beams of heaven's revolving light, involved in sorrows in the veil of night. The goddess comes. She moves divinely fair, 
olive and laurel binds her golden hair. Wherever shines this native of the skies, a numbered charms in recent graces rise. Muse, bow precipitous while my pen relates how poor her armies through a thousand gates, as when Aeolus heaven's fair face deforms and wrapped in tempest and a night of storms, astonished ocean feels the wild uproar, the refulgent surges beat the sounding shore. Oh, think as leaves in autumn's golden rain, such and so many moves the warrior's train, and bright away they seek the work of war, where high unfurled the ensign waves in air. Shall I to Washington their praise recite? Enough thou knowest them in the fields of fight. Thee first in peace and honors we demand, the grace and glory of thy martial band. Famed for thy valor, for thy virtues more, hear every tongue thy guardian aid implore. Oh, it does read very Greek-like. I mean, the references to olives and laurels and then the Greek god of wind, Aeolus, storming in the night. That's right. And all of this is referencing the battle scenes and the fighting that would be going on. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. In terms of structure, I do want to point out that it's written in stanzas. Everything is written in iambic pentameter and heroic couplets, just like the little one. That's her style. She keeps rhyming the whole way through. She's going to litter it with all these Greek noble sounding references. This is the idea that there's nobility, godlike and not nobility in what Washington is doing, even if in reality it's not godlike. He's covered in mud and his soldiers are dying and they have exposure and it's full of smallpox everywhere and they're fighting. But the way she writes it makes it sound, you know, glorious. Another thing to point out that it's addressed to this heavenly choir, the celestial choir. She addresses in the third stanza this muse. You have to remember that in Greek mythology, muses are deities that give artists inspiration for creation. So she's saying, look, muse, look at Columbia, look at Washington. Let me tell you about this amazing guy. And let me tell you about this glorious place that we're creating right now. So, you want to read the rest of it? One century scare performed its destined round when Gallic powers Columbia's fury found. And so may you, whoever dares disgrace, the land of freedom's heaven-defended race. Fixed are the eyes of nations on the scales, for in their hopes Columbia's arm prevails. A non-Britannia droops the pensive head, while round increase the rising hills of dead. Ah, cruel blindness to Columbia State, lament thy thirst of boundless power too late. Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side. Thy every action let the goddess guide. A crown, a mansion, and a throne that shine with golden fading, Washington be thine. So now we see in this next stanza, uh, Wheatley is really taking a risk. Remember, she almost met King George, and now... Look how she's treating the people that treated her like she was a celebrity in England. She's taking sides, and there's no doubt right here she's siding with the Americans. One century scarce performed its destined round when Gaelic powers Columbia's fury found. Remember, that's referencing France coming in. Now, they're not well received in England. They didn't get along. And she's <laughs> talking about the French coming and helping out Colombia. So here she goes and she says, and so may you, whoever dares disgrace the land of freedom, heaven defended race. That's a strong stand. And she's taking stands with the American. And she talks about Britannia, which of course, that's an obvious personification personification of Britain, she says is going to droop its head, referencing the idea that Britain, although she's going to say is, has a thirst of boundless power, is going to have to droop its head to the Americans. So what, you know, what she's demonstrating is she really believes in this cause, the cause of Columbia, the cause of the Americas, the cause of the pursuit of land of freedom that she believes she has a chance uh, of getting to. So in this last stanza, when she says, 
Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side. Thy every action let the goddess guide. She's not acknowledging really the greatness of the physical space. She's acknowledging the greatness of the ideals that are upheld in this image that she's personified as Columbia. Now, if you're listening to this, like I was listening to this, you get this impression of the Statue of Liberty, but that doesn't exist. She's making this up out of nothing. Uh, I mean, it is a dream that she was never going to see realized in her lifetime. I mean, after the revolution, Wheatley moves into a lot of hardship. And as we all know, the story of freedom is just getting started. And African Americans, even famous ones, are at the bottom of the social ladder. And times are devastatingly hard, as we talked about last week with the Constitution. And Wheatley had married a man, John Peters, three months after emancipation, but it seems her marriage wasn't a happy one. And finances were a big problem. And John actually ended up in debtor's prison, leaving Phyllis to work, apparently pregnant, as a scullery maid, which is the hardest work there was. She had three children who all died. The last died with her due to complications with childbirth. Ugh, I can only imagine uh, that she must have died heartbroken at the dream that was lost. And as we look back 200 years later, I have to say uh, she was the muse that helped bring to life the idea of Columbia, this vision as she saw it and as she wrote it in its idealized form, and perhaps it's safe to say, maybe she even influenced it. You know, Washington, we know, was a slave ho- slaveholder who did emancipate his own slaves upon her death and was well aware of the contradictions of this new place and was pursuing something great here. As Wheatley points out in lines five or six, the world is watching this American experiment, this idea of creating a Columbia Really, she expresses it as much larger than just this landmass that we were calling the United States. I feel like Phyllis Wheatley had some insight into this perspective, and it challenged a future potential. Uh, It's amazing that she could spot that that whole movement and feel there were people who clearly couldn't identify it as adults, and yet she, as as a child, could. Very interesting. Um, The phrase first in peace is the most famous phrase in this poem, and it was later used at Washington's funeral when uh, Henry Lee gave a 3,500-word eulogy. (laughs) In a longer passage, uh, extolling Washington, he said, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. I guess as we close out this series on American historical documents, it's appropriate that we not only end talking about the first American president, but it's appropriate that we look at him through the beautiful personification of one of the first muses to understand not just America's potential in regard to liberty, but the potential that this idea would eventually have across the globe. Sweet Phyllis. Well, that's a wrap. Uh, Next week, we're going to cross the ocean back to Europe. But this time we're going to fly over England and land in the Czech Republic to talk about one of Eastern Europeans' most anthologized existentialists, if you want to call him that. He didn't think he was. But the enigmatic Franz Kafka and a reading of his great novella, The Metamorphosis. Talk about something completely different. (laughs) That's what we're going to do. Thanks for being with us today. If you enjoyed the episode, uh, give us a five-star rating on your Apple app. And share an episode with a friend. Thanks for being with us. Peace out.